The 2024 Peer-to-Peer Professional Forum Conference is just around the corner and there is still time for you to join us in Philadelphia on February 21st through the 23rd. Each year, this conference brings hundreds of peer-to-peer leaders together from top nonprofits for three days of learning, networking, and developing plans to grow their impact. And this year's event is shaping up to be the biggest and best yet. P2P Forum 24 will feature more than 30 sessions on topics such as storytelling, relationship building, creating meaningful event experiences, and fostering community among your fundraisers. It'll also include a first look at the annual peer-to-peer top 30 benchmarking study and great networking with your peers. So for all the details and register, you can head on over to our website at peertopeerforum.com. Hope to see you in Philly. Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of the P2P Soapbox. I'm your host and P2P BFF, Marcy Maxwell, also known as the Managing Director of the Peer-to-Peer Professional Forum. I am excited to dig into a very hot topic today with one of my long-term P2P buddies and a new friend as well. One of the biggest challenges that seems to face our industry are the internal silos created specifically between the development teams and the marketing teams. This is by far one of the most common refrains I hear. And I will be honest, one of the most common things I said (laughs) during my earlier days. I hear my marketing team just doesn't understand our program. They don't get our fundraisers. They don't understand what our job is. And I also know the same is true on the flip side, that the marketing teams often say, They feel like they are treated as order takers instead of true partners who can help us achieve our goals. So what if we could see this as an opportunity instead of one of the biggest challenges? With revenue goals on the rise, shifting supporter expectations and ever-changing technology, we need as many smart people with different types of experience coming to the table. Just imagine how our peer-to-peer programs could grow if we could actually blend the great expertise that both teams bring to the conversation. And today, we have a great example of a marketing development duo. I am so happy to be joined by Marisa Hull, Vice President of Bike MS, and Peter Fryer, Associate Vice President of Constituent Experience at the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. The National MS Society is tackling the complex challenges of MS through support, advocacy, and resources, all to help people affected by MS feel more in control and less alone. Bike MS is the largest fundraising cycling series in the world with nearly 40,000 cyclists and more than 4,000 teams riding together to change the world for people with MS. As Marisa and Peter will tell you, each ride in the Bike MS series has a unique local flair. While maintaining consistently well-organized, supportive experiences for cyclists of all experience levels. And Bike MS also ranked number seven on the 2022 U.S. Peer-to-Peer Top 30. Marisa is a veteran of the peer-to-peer industry, having spent 10 years leading some of the top 10 peer-to-peer programs in the country before landing at MS. And Peter comes to the conversation with more than 15 years of marketing experience at various nonprofit and for-profit companies. So in our conversation, you will hear how Marisa and Peter have collaborated to really refine the Bike MS constituent journey and how they're working to turn it into a lifestyle brand. But maybe more importantly, how they have built a really solid cross-functional partnership along the way. We're gonna discuss the importance of trust, vulnerability, humility, and how this strong partnership manifests itself in the big strategic conversations and the day-to-day implementation work. So let's jump right in to my discussion with the National MS Society's Marisa Hull and Peter Fryer. Peter, Marisa, welcome, welcome to the P2P Soapbox. 
So excited to have you. Thank you. Excited to be here. I know. I know. This one has been a work in progress for a while. And I'm so excited to to have y'all on and, you know, in full transparency. Uh, I know I've known Marisa for a really long time in the P2P world. Although we have never worked together, we have shared multiple bosses. This so if true. any of them are listening, uh, it's their fault for bringing us together <laughs> here today. Um, so let's just jump right into the conversation. You know, I think Everyone would love to hear a little bit about your personal and professional journeys that have kind of led you to where you both are at the National MS Society. So, Marisa, I'm uh, known you longest, so I'm going to start with you. Thanks, Marcy. Good to see you. Um, well, I have been in peer-to-peer kind of by accident over 20 years. I kind of am aging myself here, but I graduated from college and I went to AmeriCorps. So that was my first job, quote unquote, um, a service job. I'm an AmeriCorps alum. Uh, I did a year in Portland, Oregon with Habitat for Humanity, and it completely changed uh, my my view. And the first event I did for Habitat for Humanity was a walk. It was at a park in North Portland. We made pancakes in a church kitchen. I recommend no one ever do that. That is a lot of sticky syrup that the pastor wasn't incredibly excited about after after that, but I was able to really see what happens when community comes together. And I had never participated in a walkathon or any thons uh, really uh, before in my life. And when I realized this was an opportunity for me to give back to my community in this way, I uh, I was in. And uh, twenty plus years later, I'm here at the National MS Society. Uh, I am the vice president for Bike MS, so I have the honor of overseeing. Uh, over 80 staff that do 50 events across the country. No small feat. No small feat. Peter, what about you? Well, I don't. Uh, I don't have any pancake stories to go with. Uh, but I, uh, my career started. Um, I actually one of my first jobs out of college. I was with United Way, and I was I did the presentations to ask people for uh, money from their paychecks and their annual giving campaigns. Um, and bounced between for-profit and nonprofit work. I also worked in concert promotion for a little while, learned a lot about marketing. And um, it's, 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 a, it's, I'd say it's tangentially related to events like we do in peer-to-peer spaces. It's, you know, you're getting people to come to something. And then um, I was at the American Diabetes Association for a while and did logistical coordination for uh, the cycling events and walks uh, on the ground here in Colorado for a while, and then I went to a brand licensing company where we owned uh, a portfolio of skateboarding and action sports brands. And so I did digital marketing there, and I learned a lot about branding and marketing strategy and audiences and all that kind of work there. So my my career has gone through these sort of undulations of all kinds of different things coming together. And after that, I came over to the society about nine years ago, over nine years ago, and. Um, I came over in the at that time in the brand group um, in the marketing department, and my job's evolved since then. And I am now the associate vice president of constituent experience for peer-to-peer fundraising events on the marketing team, which is a mouthful. But essentially, my job is I work with Marisa and all the great people over in the development side and peer-to-peer events and work on marketing strategy and marketing journeys uh, and help everyone reach their goals. And then I love the space. It's really, it's cool. It, marries a lot of the different things I've done over my career. Um, and I get to have one foot in development, kind of, and one foot in the marketing world. So I sort of exist between both both groups. And so that's my day to day. I think I'm honestly in more meetings with development teams than I am with marketing teams at this point, which is super cool. I love, I love, I always love hearing what kind of gets people to this, to this path. But, you know, it's so interesting. So you are the first marketing and development duo that we have had on the podcast. And that sometimes can be a challenging role, right? And so I know we're going to dig into that a little bit, but let's talk a little bit first about about Bike MS. So, you know, this has been a program that has been around for a really long time. It's always been a consistent member of, you know, our peer-to-peer top 30. But the two of you specifically have really been on a journey over the past couple of years to refine the program, to refine Bike MS, to really understand the constituent journey, to understand the the event voice and the event promise. So can you walk us through a little bit of, you know, what has that looked like 
who has been involved? You know, obviously marketing and development at the table together. You know, how did you get buy-in? This that's a that's a big process. So, uh, Peter, do you want to kind of jump in and tell us a little bit about the process? Sure. So when we were when we were coming out from the pandemic and we were coming back in person, um, we needed to figure out what bike was going to look like that year um, as we were on kind of a time crunch. Uh, and I think it was it, it, a lot of it came out of necessity. We, from a marketing standpoint, development, we needed a lot of great strategy from the from Marisa and her team. And um, I have a great, we all have a great relationship and, and we all have a seat at the table. And so we, t- the biggest thing is that we talk about our common goals. So we're all, we are all driving toward the same thing. And there's just different expertise in how we get there. So Marisa and her team know everything there is to know about fundraising and the events and all that. I can bring the marketing aspect and we bring those two things together and we collaboratively look at how we're going to solve those problems or attain those goals. And the other thing that we spent a lot of time doing is um, my role, it's it's not an accident that my title is constituent experience versus like a marketing strategy position. The, the goal is, is that we're putting the constituent at the center of what we do. So we look at as a cyclist or, or even paired down to a team captain or a rookie rider or different groups within the bike program how, how do how do they need to see things what is it that's important to them what do they value what do we need to put together and, and we did that work together development and marketing we did journey mapping sessions together where we would look at a particular group um so one that comes to mind is when we were looking at team captains and what they needed what, what you're really trying to get at is what is it that motivates them and what do they really what do they really want? What do they need? And so we were, we were needing to pare back the events a little bit that year. We were looking at virtual options if people weren't comfortable coming back in person. And we we did some interviews. This is where the development staff was so helpful. They have all the relationships. And so they got to ask questions to people and say, hey, what do you think about this? Or what is it that you value? And so we got real-time feedback. And so together, we collaboratively came up with that program. And just one of the interesting things that we heard was we were looking at fundraising minimums and things because we weren't sure how the the value of the of the event was going to was going to look based on what we were going to be able to deliver that year and we had team captain say don't you dare lower the fundraising minimum like we are associated we love bike ms we love doing this we do it it's very important this is important for us from a fundraising perspective and so that was the beginning of us starting to see how people really aligned to bike more than just coming to do an event how they really are have an affinity for the for the for the brand so Marisa, who invited who? How did this process start? Did this come from development seeking out the help of marketing or kind of how did the process initiate? I used to work for somebody, probably someone that we had in common, actually, now that I think about it, Marcy, who, uh, but everyone's heard the saying, don't waste a good crisis. And it's not to minimize what was going on in 2020, but at the end of February, 2020, I started at the National MS Society as the head of Bike MS. And within two weeks of my job, uh, the world started to shut down because of COVID and the pandemic. And being someone who was new to the society and having people look at me and say, what are we going to do? And me being having to be able to say, I actually don't know. Because in all the years I've been fundraising, I all of us had to look at ourselves, right? And say, we've never, yeah. ever had to solve something like this. And so in that time is when marketing and development came together. There was a shared goal that we knew that we had to do something to continue to engage people. Of course, we needed to continue to raise money and revenue for the society and for people living and uh, with MS. But we knew together that we were going to be stronger than if we tried to do it by ourselves. So I don't actually know who came to who first, but it was very... It was very natural when it happened. Um, It might have actually been marketing saying, hey, we think we have a vendor. That is how it happened, huh, Peter? Uh, Someone on on our team in marketing came to us and say, we work with this vendor on some marketing projects. And they have asked us, what kind of help do we need right now? They wanted to give us some pro bono work. And that's actually how it started. Marketing said, you know what? Bike is coming up. 
Um, that, you know, these are our next big set of events and I bet they could use some help. And that's actually how the work started. Um, and when we had our first, uh, our first virtual event. Uh, and that really laid the groundwork of how we started working together because at that time, no one needed to be the most exact or right person in the room. We all knew that we needed to bring our talents. We all knew that we needed to raise our hand when we didn't know the answer and ask for help. And one of the things that we did in the process that we went through, and Peter just alluded to this a little bit, is we went deep with our staff. We know and believe that the people that know our constituents most are the people that see them day to day. It's your field staff. So as leaders of the program, Peter, leader in marketing, me a lead of a peer to peer, we have an idea of where we think we need to go, but we use our staff to really help us drive and ensure that we're going in the right direction. And we listen to what they say. We listen to the challenges that we they have. We use them to help introduce us to those people that Peter were talking about that love Bike MS so much, that love the society so much. And using them in that process really helped us to understand who was coming to our event, whether it was virtual in that first year or in-person events that we have now or a mix of what that looks like. We use that process to get to know them better. So I imagine this journey is it's doesn't have an end date, right? You're probably it's a constant process. But what did you learn when you think about the really understanding the event personality of a program like Bike MS? You know, what does that look like? How does it come to life in your marketing? How does it come to life in your communication, your on event experiences? Tell me, tell me the results. I love that question because it was one of the questions that we had to answer. We talk about Bike MS as one brand. It's one event, but we have unique experiences across the country. We have 50 unique events that reflect the local community, that reflect our most important cyclists, are the people that day in and day out are thinking about Bike MS, the team captain that is recruiting all year. We had to answer, how do we say to 50 unique communities across the country, you are part of Bike MS, but we want you to celebrate your local pride and the local flair about your Bike MS event. When we started looking into that, we saw that we had some challenges out of the gate in the way that we were marketing because it's hard to market individually. At times, when you're in a system or you're using a program that sets out one set of emails or you have to make one change to the website, we all know this. How do you not change it across 50 instances? We had to solve a lot for how do we keep the parameters of our brand and what Bike MS is, but how do we allow people to reflect what's local and get their local communities excited about attending the event. And that's when Peter and I started working really closely together. uh, Because again, that was something I did not know how to solve. I knew the vision of where we needed to be. I knew as a fundraiser, that was going to resonate most with our supporters to see themselves at the event, to be proud of what they bring locally. But I had no idea how to do it, Marcy, from an email perspective, changing websites. It just wasn't, wasn't what I do well. And Peter listening to me and talking again and again about this challenge started helping me think about it in a different way. That's absolutely right. One of the, the things about Bike is that the value proposition is what that event experience is locally. So the overall brand tells you what Bike is about, but those local events are really important, particularly in, some, in an event like this. And so as I was coming up, we were trying to figure it out. So from a really, so Marcy, sometimes I, I tend to take things that are big and make them extremely pragmatic. So if this becomes really dry, just let me know. But what we what we were looking at is we started to chunk out where are the things that we so are just for knowledge base, we have a centralized marketing department at the National Mass Society. So there's one marketing department that works on everything for the whole organization. We don't have it's not it's not locally based. And so it allows us to do things enterprise wide, which is great, which is why we can have marketing that supports so many events or why myself I can be looking at across all peer to peer. But it also means that some of that customization can be challenging. And so we've been working, and I would say we chip away at it every year. We get new things. We are doing things this year. And if you had said, could you do that two years ago? We'd say, I have no idea how we're going to do that. And now we're doing it. And the way we've gotten at it is we look at what's important. We did need to align on certain things with the with the brand and with our messaging and marketing and everything, but there's a lot that's look particularly what the events are. And so we have, just as an example, we have a whole process by which when 
staff is getting their local events set up because we have a central team that builds all the websites. When staff is getting those set up, there's an ability for them to give us bullet points. And what I always say in the meetings is, tell me what makes your event cool. Like if we ran into each other at a bar and you were so excited about this event, what are the five bullet points you would tell me about why your event is, is the best? And then what we do is they, they submit those to us. And then with the content team in marketing, we work to finesse that into some language that we can then use in different areas through our marketing. So it's a way for us to continue to localize things while at the same time doing things at an enterprise scale. And so that's that's constantly the thing that we're working through because it's so important for the bike brand for people to be able to see themselves in it. And so we just started to chip away at that. We had some things where we needed to communicate about different promotions that were happening for a specific event. And um, the way the way I've really solved it is I, I, I say we we make plans for the unplanned. So there's a lot of things that are consistent across brands. They're going to be different. What's cool about this ride and what's cool about this ride may be different, but the fact that they both have something very interesting about the ride is in common. So what are we going to do to handle things that are unique to a ride? You can, you, We can usually get about 70% of the way there of what we need to do. And then it's just taking it over that last bit, again, with working with local teams or with bike staff to talk, to work with us on what that's going to look like. And then we can get it out the door. And so we've, we've made a lot of progress over the last four years on how we're doing that and getting that pendulum to swing back from being completely aligned across everything to we're aligned and we're able to put local flavor in there and imagery or content or descriptions or, or things like that. Cause it, it is really important and it's, it's essential to the value proposition of bike MS to talk about what's going on in the local event. Absolutely. Well, and I think it's so important for w- those local volunteers to feel a sense of ownership, but also to prioritize, you know, where where our customization is going to actually make an impact, right? And I think uh, there was a time before centralized marketing teams existed where I think a lot of times the field staff, it was, it was a little bit about control. Let's be honest. Marisa and I both were in those roles. We love to control everything about our events instead of saying, you know, let's let a centralized marketing team do this for you, deliver what you need so that you can be out in the community, which is something that they cannot do, right? An email can be written from a centralized office, but a meeting with a team captain can't happen necessarily from a centralized office. And so I think what you're describing about allowing that localization and finding a way to prioritize making it work is is so important. Um, The priority is, it's huge, Marcy. And the example I think of is when you're presented with facts and sometimes as fundraisers, you don't want to hear that. So some of you might be listening thinking, wow, they're talking a lot and a lot and a lot about experience. And the fundraiser in me wants people to care more about the email that says, um, you know, fundraising deadline is coming up and we want you to start a, a, a Facebook fundraiser or a social fundraiser. I want that to be my highest opened email and it never is. It never is. In fact, what we learned is the highest opened emails and the highest looked at web page by far was the event details page. I didn't love hearing that, but when we started talking about that and Peter always was reminding me, but remember, they only care about the event details. We had to adjust our fundraising strategy a little bit around that. If that's what the people want to talk about and that's where they're landing, then we had to change the way that we interacted with people. So what we've started doing is since we know people were landing on that page and we know this email with the event day details is the most open of our entire, of our entire three weeks before the event. We use that as an opportunity to connect with our folks. So that's when marketing is running in the background, emails are going, people are going, actively going to the event details site. We don't need, we don't need to tell them to do that anymore. It gave our fundraisers and our relationship folks a chance to talk about something that's important to them. And we learn that by looking at the data, looking at the marketing data and seeing where people are. So now that phone call three weeks before the event leads in with, do you have everything you need? Do you know where you're going? Is there anything I can help you with? And look at your team fundraising. And that's how we've been able to balance those conversations. So it's a more authentic conversation. And we're using the data that marketing gave us, whether I liked it or not, (laughs) whether I wished it to be different, we were able to adjust the way that we interact with our folks. And that's what's so cool about thinking about the event personality and how do you bring all of that to life 
in the work that we know that needs to be done. We're all here for the same reason, to end MS. We know a way to do that is in the community, in that strong bike MS community, but we can't make people be who they are or who they don't want to be. And so this experience and this exercise has really changed the way that our staff are able to interact with that. And that's how we get them to buy in too. Because we're saying this is what matters to people. It's a more comfortable call. It's a more warm call. You know, it's going to be more receptive than if I'm calling every three weeks to ask you, have you hit your fundraising minimum yet? Or you had 15 people on your team last year and now you only have 10. So it's been really cool to see that, Marcy. And it's a different approach than what you and I probably did 15, 20 years ago. But folks are changing. It's about them. We're at the center of, of a lot. And we think about how our world impacts us. And our event participants, they're not any different. You know, they see it in the same way. Yeah. They're not our participants. We're their charity of choice, right? That's one of the things that that I love to say. But, you know, one of the things that you and I've talked about, or the three of us have talked about is one of the goals for the Bike MS program is to almost feel like, you know, we've used the term lifestyle brand, right? So do you want to talk a little bit about what exactly does that mean when you say our one of our goals is to make Bike MS feel like a lifestyle brand? Well, this is something that came out of our partnership with marketing too, is they challenged me to look at the Bike MS brand in a different way, not as a year-round fundraising campaign, not even as a get-together on a weekend, but really understanding what Bike MS mean, means to folks. And so when you think of brands that are some of the best, most iconic brands, oftentimes it's just seeing the brand makes people want to be part of that. I think of Peloton. That became and has become lifestyle for a lot of people. It's just not about the bike or the brand. It's about the personalities that are teaching the classes. It's about the leaderboard. It's about the Facebook groups that start with different challenges. I'm not saying our brand will be like some of these iconic brands, but we aspire to create that sort of environment where people see themselves in Bike MS. And Peter, you've helped me so much uh, kind of see that in in a different way. And you always tell me, remember to put the person in in the middle of, of the decision and not, you know, the business need in the middle of that. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a, a big discussion, and that's one of the ways that we're getting at. Going back to your example earlier, Marisa, the 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 constituent experience is a lot about us working to the aspiration of people associating with the brand. Because if if what we want to be is a really well supported, amazing ride, incredible experience, people have an affinity not just for the event but for bike MS just in general. That comes with how they engage with staff. That comes with what the marketing is that they get. It comes with what their on event experience is. All of those things play a role in how on how they're going to engage with us. And so in Marisa's example earlier about those phone calls that were going out, the way I've mapped some things out, the way I'm thinking about how we're getting to that lifestyle space and putting the person at the center of what we do is if you look at it from that person's perspective, what that person that has now experienced is. I had a question about this event and I went to the website and oh my gosh, they have all this great information on there and all kinds of things that are above and beyond and aren't just, here's what time you need to sign in to register. It's got all of this cool stuff. And you know, I got that email and that text message that reminded me about it. I really appreciate that they sent that to me. And I got a phone call from so-and-so that was talking to me about it. And I can't wait to tell them about my kids band concert from last week. Now that person, that's their experience of bike MS is those five different things and all those other touch points. And so for us to get to the aspirational level of people really aligning to, to bike and really feeling a part of it, that's that's what is going to get us there. And so um, for me, that's what we're continuing to look at and, you know, always, always trying to improve on it. So it makes my heart as a, you know, lifelong peer-to-peer fundraiser, um, happy to hear this great relationship that y'all have built between marketing and the development team. You know, I have had amazing marketing development relationships and I have had really challenging ones. And, you know, one of the most common refrains that we hear from a lot of our peer-to-peer community is, you know, marketing doesn't understand what we need. They don't understand peer-to-peer. Um, and on the flip side, you know, the marketing team saying, you know, the event team, the, the field staff, they just don't get it. They don't get marketing. So what do you think 
are really the keys to, to being successful and to having such a good partnership between your two teams? I love that question. And I've heard, I've heard the same for years and have had different experiences as well. And I know one, one of the pieces that, that is so important to that, especially from a, from a fundraiser is sometimes letting go. And I talked about this a little bit at the beginning of the podcast is becoming comfortable as leaders to say, I don't have all the answers and I can articulate my challenges or I can articulate where I think we should be. Or sometimes it's fundraisers in my gut, right? I know we could be so much successful at this. I know we have it in us. I'm just struggling to figure out how to get there. I'm struggling how to figure out how to acquire more people or for this one event where we're way behind and I can't figure out why. When I've become more comfortable in sharing my challenges with sharing the data, with just frankly being more vulnerable and being okay, not having all of the answers, we've been able to build trust. Um, and I know I've been able to build trust to say, hey, I'm stuck and I really need help because marketing experts are different than fundraisers or a salesperson or whatever. We just have different strengths. And when they all come together, it's it, it, it works beautifully. Uh, but that's something, that's a step that I've had to take. And Marcy, it's not, easy, right? There's natural tension when folks work together and they're trying to solve big problems, especially in the nonprofit space. If we don't solve the problems that we're, we're, we're set to do, like it, it impacts people's lives and livelihood. And I think we are so, all of us in the space, we're so dedicated to our causes and we're so dedicated to doing more for the people that are involved with our charities and involved with our movements. and. Being able to come together, to share, to say, hey, we're all in this together has really been, for me, a different way that I've been able to work with marketing at different organizations. And with Peter in particular and this team, it, it's been great because they also, on the other side, are learning my business and really understand my goals. Peter said at the end of the call, he's probably in more development meetings than marketing. And I, I can guarantee that knowing what that calendar looks like. He really is an extension of the team. And every time, Peter, you get on one of our all staff calls, I feel like all the emojis of the cheering, like Peter's here, we're going to get something great today. You're, like, <laughs> you're a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but I appreciate it. I think, <laughs> yeah, to, yeah to, to go along with that, Marcy, it's, it's a really good question. And um, I've been thinking a lot about it. I, I think for me, from the marketing side of it, uh, it has been always listening and trying to get at the heart of whatever it is we're trying to solve collaboratively or together. And so it's sometimes I will ask a lot of Marisa can attest to like really annoying questions to, to really press, but it's, it's in the service of what is it? What is it? One of our other leaders in the organization, as Peter always says, what is it you are trying to do? And so we try to answer that question. Like, what is it? What are we trying to do? to do here because then we can figure out how to get to it. So we have really great conversations about that. I think the other thing is um, Marisa was talking about how, you know, letting go was important from a marketing standpoint. I think sometimes that I hear sometimes is, well, marketing just said no, or we're not going to do this or marketing said, no, I'm getting, I'm getting the nods, Marcy. So I know you've had that conversation and I've told my team, you know, sometimes the answer is going to end up being no, but I would, I really want the conversation to be, that we're opening the door by saying, not sure, tell me more about what we're going for or trying to do. Because, so, because often the thing that's being asked for is not the thing we need to do, but the thing we're trying to solve is totally relevant. And maybe it's, we should do this thing and it would be even better and then we could really get at this. Or, oh, that's a really great question. I hadn't thought of that. Let's see how we could incorporate that or whatever. So I try, I try really hard for us to be open to whatever the question or the recommendation or whatever is coming in because at the end of the day we're we're all driving to the, to the same thing we are trying to make these events successful so that we can be successful as an organization and nms ultimately and so that keeps uh keeps us pretty focused and so i think that's that's been a lot of it um and trying to understand where the where the team is coming from again, listening and really understanding what the needs are and what people want. And the staff, we've gotten into a really great spot where we're getting we're getting things from staff where they'll say, 
Um, I just had one come up with another event this morning. I said, people are, are grabbing this thing, but they're having trouble using it because they don't want this. Well, it, I'm only making stuff for those people to use. So if it doesn't work, then we'll scrap it and rebuild it. It's fine. <laughs> like, like, if it doesn't work for the external person, I mean, that's the ultimate goal, then let's, let's look at it. And so I want to, the staff to know that we have this open line of communication coming up to leadership of, yeah, if you're seeing something or hearing something, we need to know about it because that's how, and I think, Marisa, that's helped with the relationship too, because uh, it feels like the staff knows that we're open to having those conversations and listening and understanding. And that's impacted the way we've been able to run our team. So all of this trust that we're building at a campaign leadership level, we then are demonstrating to our field staff and our relationship staff. And that has impacted the way they work because what we tell them all the time is we have a responsive marketing plan with responsive colleagues behind the plan that are always looking at data. They're looking at inputs. They're listening to feedback. They're seeing what people post on social. They are, they're taking all of this and they're doing that for you. So you can focus on the important work. And I will tell you, Marcy, well, marketing is important. I shouldn't say that, but that was my fundraising bias coming out where I want to see the staff <laughs> with their participants, <laughs> right? With their supporters. Um, and I will say, in all of my career, I've, I'm almost there, Marcy, I think, with the team. I, I see less now of the fundraising staff trying to renegotiate our marketing plan or, and not to say it doesn't happen, or send out a lot of emails on top of that. And it happens, and we use it as opportunities for education. But as Peter said, he then uses it as an opportunity to listen. Why do you think you had to send out this email that probably doesn't have a great open rate and there's too many font colors in there and the subject line might be putting us on a block list, right? These are things that as fundraising professionals, we think about all the time. This relationship now that we have internally, our staff, they're doing less of that because they know they have a place as Peter just described. Like, I don't think this is working or this is the feedback I'm getting. So they know they, again, they know they have a marketing plan and they have colleagues behind that that are really actively driving and making sure everything's running in the background so that we can do the people to people work, the human to human work, which is really, again, that's the magic of peer to peer. We all, we all know that. And so the staff now are starting to believe this. And so again, this started in 2020. So it's not short. It's 2024. It's almost been four years since Peter and I started this journey together, even though Peter, it feels like sometimes. 40 years and sometimes four days. <laughs> it's hard to yeah, really, it really it's does. It really does. Yeah. But we've been doing this for four years now. And so, and this is the result. And it, it's so worth it to really start that work um, together because the result, and we're just getting better now, right? We're just, every year we're improving, we're, we're evolving. And it's been, it's been fun. Well, what I love hearing is it takes, you know, it takes a lot of, I mean, humility, you use the word vulnerability, Marisa to be asked the question, why, and not take offense to it, right? To say, why do you do that? I know I've had, again, I've had uh, relationships where uh, work relationships where people say, it feels like you're always questioning me. And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm just trying to learn. I'm just trying to understand. So asking that question and knowing on both sides that this is not a condemnation of what you're doing. This is not questioning you and your decisions it's asking questions to understand because it's gonna get us to an even better place together I think I only want that for for everybody listening to have that rapport with all kinds of teams that they collaborate with within their organization this has been great I, I know there's probably a ton of people that are uh jealous of this relationship right but there are probably also a lot of people who are thinking how could I get more involved with the National MS Society the spike MS event sounds great do they have any job openings so whatever they're wanting to do if someone is looking to get more involved with bike MS or with National MS Society where where can we send them in our show notes bikems.org easy easy one to go to and that's our that's our main website that has all of our events listed and and ways to get involved uh, and then for the National MS Society, it's nationalmssociety.org. They can go to bikems.org and find out all the fun event details for all of your events around the country. Because that's all what people are looking exactly. for. All 50 unique experiences. 
That's right. I love it. Well, Marisa and Peter, this was so great. Just kind of getting an uh, an understanding of this great rapport that y'all have built and all the great work that y'all are doing with Bike MS. And thanks so much for joining us on the P2P Soapbox. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Marcy. We appreciate it. The P2P Soapbox is produced in partnership with True Story FM, engineering by Pete Wright. Music this week is by Russo. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, we hope you'll consider doing just that for our show. But the best thing that you can do to support the P2P Soapbox is simply to share the show with a friend or colleague. Thank you for listening.